Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced and you're listening to Economics and Finance for uh, Noobs. And uh, today what I want to do is talk about the relationship between sort of government spending and inflation. Okay, because this is sort of like hot topic conversation when it comes to um, politics. And again, the point of this conversation isn't to tell you like oh, who you should vote for or who is right, who is wrong. At the end of the day, vote the way you're going to vote. At the end of the day, politicians are not economists. They're going to say what's in their political best interests. Um, and that goes for all sides, all parties, all the time. Um, but what I do want to do is help you understand the issue so that way you can wade through what different talking heads say to better, you know, kind of wade through what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, I guess, is, is my point. Okay, so again, this is not meant to sort of steer you towards any particular uh position okay so if you think government should or shouldn't spend money this is not going my intention here is not to change your mind on that um but it is to help you understand the mechanisms around these things okay because you you know i could explain how x can cause y and you may believe that trade-off is worth it you may believe that trade-off isn't worth it i'm just here help you through here to help you understand that there is a trade-off okay so First, let's understand sort of like inflation in the sense that like establish that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. I mean, in the sense that money supply has to go up for inflation to happen on a broad manner. Okay. The simplest way to think about this is imagine there's your everyone who exists are like 10 people in one room. Okay. Now, each of those people in that room, so those 10 people in the whole world, each have one dollar. Okay. That's all they have. So theoretically, what's the most that anyone else in the room could charge them for something? Okay, theoretically one dollar because that's all any person has. So by the fact that they only have a dollar, they can only charge a dollar. Now theoretically, maybe you know some of these people they group together to make a group purchase. Okay, so they could increase their purchasing power. But the most that could that could occur is ten dollars at any given moment. So the maximum price you can charge okay is ten dollars okay now you can stretch it a little further if you start getting to clump you know some some fine you know you start including debt so the idea is like okay hey you know what if they finance an expenditure and they say okay hey we'll pay ten dollars and we'll borrow another ten okay theoretically you can expand that further but even then there, there there's like limits depending on sort of like what lenders are willing to lend okay so bottom line is like there is a limit that exists there's constraints because of the actual base money the actual money that exists okay however you measure that money frankly that's not the point here okay so if i were to double the money so now everyone has two dollars okay theoretically again without a world without financing without debt the highest price that could be possibly paid is two dollars per person or twenty dollars if they were to all group together and again you could borrow against the twenty dollars and Let's say you were able to borrow 100% of the value of your $20, which is typically not the case. Um, you know, theoretically, let's say $40 would be the maximum price possible. Okay. So, but you see, like, the more money there is, the more higher prices can be. Okay. Someone could want to charge more. So someone could want to charge $50, but there just isn't the physical capability to, you know, to charge that. Okay. Um, basically, you'd be limited to without financing you'd be limited to the actual money and then with financing you're limited to sort of like the collateral the, the necessary collateralization of any financing okay and then even then okay if you were to finance that okay there would actually have to be money set aside so you couldn't even charge 40 actually so the 20 dollars would be so like let's say there's 20 dollars okay and you want to and you want to pay for something that's 40 and you say hey someone would willing to lend you 20 dollars you there has to be some sort of belief that there's this extra twenty dollars somewhere, okay, and that's just getting into more complex sort of banking concepts and fractional reserve banking and deposits and let's not go there, okay. But you get the basic idea. The more money there is, the higher prices can be because there's a physical limit to how much you can charge because there's a physical limit to how much money can be transferred to you, okay. Um, again, that can get that 
physical base money can then be leveraged and expand that a bit, but not infinitely. Okay? So the only way to push further is for there to be more money. Okay. So now let's imagine a situation. So basically, think of interest rates as the price of money. Okay? So when people want to borrow money, they pay interest. So if more people want to borrow money, so there's an increased demand for money, that's going to push prices up, meaning interest rates are going to go up, and then vice versa. Okay, so think of the supply and demand of money that that clearing prices interest rates. Okay, cool. So knowing that, let's say that the economy is in a recession. Okay, whether you agree this is the right policy or not, typically what a central bank will do, okay, and central banks, regardless of how you feel about them, are generally the the typical mechanism you have in most places around the world, control the money supply. So central bank is like in basically the banker's bank. They sort of like they supervise the banking system and control how much money there is in the economy. So what generally what a central bank will do when the economy is doing poorly, their job is to protect the banking system. Okay, because if the banking system falls apart, there are grander economic ramifications. So what they're going to do is they're generally going to want to lower interest rates. Okay. By lowering interest rates, okay, what happens is that people are going to have people who want to start a business can more easily finance that. People who want to buy X can easily borrow the money for that. And the way they do this is by flooding banks with money. Okay, they don't just necessarily hand them cash. What they're going to do is buy government bonds off of them. Okay, so they buy up the government debt that the different banks hold, and that's generally how money gets injected. Cool. And since the banks now have more money, they can charge less for it. So interest rates go down. Okay, but what? But the thing is that the only fly in that ointment is what if a bunch of more people than before are now asking for, not only asking for money, but qualify to get that money? Because again, there's also underwriting and determining whether people have credit and whatnot. Okay, so just because people want to borrow more money than they can. But then, but the best credit regardless of whether you agree with the statement or not, is the government. The reason being is the government, worse can go worse, regardless of how well they manage their financial house, they can always just print the money. So theoretically, like they could, you will always get your money back when you lend money to the government because they can just print it. That's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, it's just the reality of it. So basically, if the government wants to borrow more money, they can okay banks will always be willing to lend more money to the government because they know it's risk free okay and they know that generally at some point probably that the central bank will buy those bonds off of them when they need to stimulate the economy okay but this creates a, this creates a problem though what happens if the fed or a central, any central bank for that matter uh is currently lowering interest rates by buying bonds from the banks so the banks are getting flooded with money but then what happens, instead of lending all that money to all the people who want to borrow it for businesses or construction projects and things like that, the government says, hey, we're going to spend a whole bunch more money too. And again, if the government isn't getting the tax revenue to spend for that money they want to spend, then they have to borrow it. So now the, the government is going to the banks and saying, hey, we want to borrow that money, that new money. Okay. So what happens is that now this increase in demand for money because of the extra government spending, because the extra big government deficit, is going to put upward pressure on interest rates. Because again, if there's if the demand for money increases, then the price of money is going to increase. Okay, so it's going to be you know you have the government and then everybody else fighting over the money. That's going to increase the price of the money, interest rates, which would be the exact opposite of what the central bank wants, because the central bank is in the process of lowering interest rates to you know, stimulate the economy per se. Whether you think that's the right policy or not, that's not the point. But that's what they're doing. So this puts, so when the government does this, they put the central bank in a weird place. They basically say, okay, well, you could just basically undo what we were trying to do and force us and let interest rates go up because you're borrowing all the money we're trying to inject for everybody else to borrow. Okay, or we're just going to have to buy more bonds from the banks and inject more money in the economy to facilitate that extra spending from the government. Okay, which means there's now more money in the economy. Okay, and again, the more of that money there is, the 
uh, higher prices can theoretically can go up. Okay, people can now bid. Up, whoever has that money can bid things up, and then once they buy something that's more expensive, then somebody else now has more money, and then they can bid something up. And you know, little by little, this kind of trickles throughout the economy as people start bidding up the prices of things because somebody somewhere has extra money that they can say, hey, I'm willing to pay more. And that means the next person's going to say, I'm willing to pay more for the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. It's not going to happen evenly. You don't necessarily know exactly where that increases in prices are going to hit hardest. This is referred to as uh, Kantian effects, uh, based on Richard, the economist of Richard Kantian. He probably wrote probably the earliest treatise on economics that I can think of. Um, but essentially... Um, the idea is that this money is going to have ripple effects on prices. They're not going to necessarily be even. It's not like everything's just going to go up in price 5% or 10%. Using price indices, you can get a general, like, not, I wouldn't even say average, but a general approximation of the average percentage that prices are going up in a very imperfect way. Um, but prices are going to go up because there's more money, and that means people can bid up prices. Okay, and that's just going to ripple throughout the economy in different ways. Okay, and it's going to have more effects other than just increasing in prices because places where the prices go up first, you know, it's going to look like, hey, this part of this sector of the economy is doing really well, and that's going to have certain effects on labor because people are going to be like, hey, that's where all the money can be made, so I'm going to go train to go work in that industry. Um, you know, resources are going to steer towards that industry versus another industry. So there's all these sort of uneven effects throughout the economy that you just can't measure, you can't anticipate. You just know they're going to happen. Okay, and then those will generally come to roost later. and That is what it is. Okay, but bottom line is the more government spends, they are adding to the demand for money. And if the Fed is in the process of wanting to lower rates, so again, think about like during the, the pandemic era when the Fed was lowering interest rates to kind of like push back against basically a, a crumbling global economy. Um, and then the government is also spending money, okay, you are creating this environment where basically um, the Fed has to continue increasing the money supply, which creates this foundation, which like once the inflation settles, what they're going to have to do is that they have to then eventually when they realize, hey, like the inflation thing is out of the bag, they have to take that money away from the banks, but they're going to have to take more than they would have because they have to make for they have to make up for the extra they had to buy previously. So interest rates will have to eventually go higher than they would have naturally because they have they were because there was a much grander effort, more had to be purchased to keep them lower than they otherwise would have absent that extra government spending. Okay? Now again, does that mean that government spending wasn't or was worth it? That's a value judgment, okay? Um because there's no way to truly measure the counterfactual. There's no way to truly, we can theorize and, and, and assume um, what the world would have looked like absent that spending. But the reality is there is a trade-off. So when the government spends that large amount of money, you are increasing the demand for money. This is going to create pressures to either raise interest rates at that point or, to, or for an increase in the money supply further to prevent the immediate increase in rates which will then in turn turn into inflation pressures, which will then have to be met with a greater increase in interest rates than there otherwise would have been, okay, if not as much money hadn't been injected into the economy, okay? You may think that the spending that was done to, the spending that was done that caused that was worth it, but it doesn't change that that's what happened, okay? So hopefully this helps you understand the inflation mechanism a little bit more. Now, you know, you'll hear people theorize that, oh, well, there's ways government can offset that, you know, inflation. They could tax more, okay? Um, the problem with that is, again, you don't know how that money is going to cycle through the economy. You don't really know, oh, this industry kind of hit, absorbed that extra liquidity first, Okay, so then what happens is if you just create like a blanket, hey, we're going to increase taxes for everybody. Well, there's people who aren't necessarily immediately getting the benefits of that extra liquidity, but you are imposing them extra costs. So you're creating this crunch on parts of the economy that where it's not justified, and you're probably creating less of a constraint 
than warranted where that extra liquidity is being hit, um, but you don't know. But then what happens is that you're still creating sort of this inequity and you're just exasperating that inequity because you're hitting the people who aren't benefiting harder and she's probably the, the people who are benefiting are still probably, still probably benefiting net more than the additional tax. So then you just literally exasperate that inequity depending on what the exact tax policy is. And if you try to target that tax policy, the problem is, is that you that always tends to get corrupted because people, everyone is, you know, they're going to want to shape how those rules get eventually run. So basically, whoever didn't have a say in that process is the one who's going to get hit hurt, not necessarily the people. And the people who have the most say to to be in that process are the people who are currently benefiting from the way things are. So it's you you're not generally because of the way the political process works, you generally don't get the results you want. So um, you can theoretically say, oh well, yeah, you know, if you basically people who have extra money, you take that money from them through taxation, um, you might dampen some of that effect. Like theoretically, that works, but in practice, because of the way the political process works, that it's much harder said than done and because again it's not a even distribution of new money into the economy you know you aren't and you so doing an even distribution of additional costs when you're not doing an even distribution of 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 liquidity uh you are essentially whacking the inequality stick on the economy okay so those who say hey let's tax more to offset the extra liquidity you are literally exasperating uh economic you know, inequality of wealth and income. When you, and the irony is, is generally it's the people, people who advocate that are the people who most talk about the inequality of income and wealth. Okay, so um, hopefully you guys enjoyed that and that got you to think a little bit more about the process. Again, this is this is not to change sort of like what you think government should or shouldn't do. Anyone who knows me knows sort of where I stand on that. Um, this is not to change sort of like Oh, this party's smart. I honestly, I, I'm very personally very skeptical of everybody when it comes to politics. But I do want you to understand, to be able to kind of see through the BS of talking heads and be able to kind of understand what the economy's really doing more, more so for your own personal understanding and for your own personal decision making um, to make wiser decisions in preparing and insulating yourself in these kinds of situations. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoyed that. My name is Alex Rousset. I'll see you later on, this is, you're listening to Economics and Finance for Noobs. Have a great day and enjoy.